This video is about the history of Beowulf and be sure you're taking notes on your notes template. In this video we'll understand how Beowulf was passed from generation to generation via this oral tradition that you heard about a little bit with the Anglo-Saxons, but we'll talk about how it relates to Beowulf specifically. Understand the, how the spread of Christianity influenced the story of Beowulf and how you're going to see parts of Christianity within it. And then understand how we can still read Beowulf today, um, a poem that was literally written about the 5th century um, and written in the 11th century. Like, How in the world do we still have this? So remember from our Anglo-Saxon video that Beowulf is about a Germanic warrior. So he is one of the warriors from Scandinavia, and it's set in the 5th century. So here we have a story of the Anglo-Saxon's ancestors and a story that was passed down through this oral tradition that we'll talk about. So as a refresher on oral tradition, that means it's a story that's told by memory, passed along from person to person or tribe to tribe or generation to generation, kind of like this picture here. And you can think about um, the mead hall and how people would sit and talk and spread stories. But the Anglo-Saxons, each tribe also had a shope, it's pronounced shope, an Anglo-Saxon oral poet. And that was essentially the tribe's entertainer and historian, the person who would recite stories from memory with some kind of a lyre or harp, as you see here in this photo. Um, and then stories that offered a moral component. So in some way, the shope was like the, the spreader of whatever you know moral was being um, promoted throughout the tribe. So the shope would have stories of good behavior and bad behavior. Um, and the shope would be in charge of immortalizing or putting a story to some of the brave deeds of the tribe's members so that they would be remembered for a long time afterwards. So even though there were shopes and people who were in charge of keeping these stories and passing them on, Beowulf is still like a big game of telephone. You know, in a game of telephone and you have one kid who says a, um, whispers something to another and the story changes by the time you get down to the end of the line. Well, Beowulf was exactly that way. It wasn't written down for so long that we have a story that is sort of morphed, probably, from what the original version was, just because from shope to shope and tribe member to tribe member, the story would alter just a little bit before it was actually written down. And in that way, this big game of telephone was influenced by the spread of Christianity uh, through the island of Britannia. So in the year 313, the Roman Emperor Constantine issued the Edict of Milan. And the Edict of Milan decriminalized Christianity. So it said you can be Christian. We won't um, persecute you for that. And as a result, promoted religious tolerance among um, Europeans and then through Britannia. Um, Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire because now it was tolerated. So by the year 597, the Roman monk Constantine arrived in Britannia and his job was to convert the Anglo-Saxons to Christianity. And he successfully converted King Ethelbert, an Anglo-Saxon king, and then King Ethelbert and Augustine were able to start promoting Christianity through many of the Anglo-Saxon tribes. Um, and because that, that missionary, that mission trip was so successful, we had many missionaries who followed, and so pagan, paganism, um, worshipping multiple gods, and Christianity with one god existed side by side for four centuries. So you can see, um, you know, this tribe converted to Christianity, and then it spread to this tribe and this tribe, but that was a pretty slow progression. And because Beowulf is a big game of telephone, it takes on these elements of Jesus' story and elements of Christianity in general. Now, notice that it's still a pagan story, right? In some ways, the original Beowulf or the original telling of Beowulf from the Shope probably didn't have any Christian elements. But then as this big game of telephone spread for centuries and centuries, it takes on different elements of Jesus' story or of Christianity. And so that's why we're going to see those two existing side by side. Let's talk a little bit about the Beowulf manuscript um, itself. So the manuscript was written down by two Christian monks in the 11th century. Now notice, they are Christian monks, so that probably also influenced why we see Christianity or Jesus' story in the manuscript that we read. The manuscript, the story is that it was forgotten about for about 600 years, and nobody knew where it was, um, nobody knew really that it existed. And then in the 16th century, we rediscovered this manuscript, this really old written version of Beowulf. 
But as scholars in the 16th to the 20th century read through it, they thought, mm, this is not any big deal. It's just a primitive, savage people. All they were doing is killing monsters, and they were just a bunch of warriors, whatever. It's not a work of art. We don't need to pay attention to it. But that changed in the 20th century, the 1900s, for two reasons. And reason number one is that this guy, J.R.R. Tolkien, he's the author of Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, he, quote, rediscovered Beowulf in 1936. So he was a professor in England, and he literally wrote this essay, Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics, and decided that Beowulf is actually a very artistic and complex story. Um, and he, in his work as a professor, kind of explained, here's why it's meaningful, here's why it's artistic and complex. And then people followed and started to understand more of why Beowulf was such a great work of art. Reason number two that we can get excited about the Beowulf manuscript now is the discovery of an Anglo-Saxon burial ship at Sutton Hoo, that's in England, in the year 1939. Now check out this picture. This is the burial ship. A couple things to know about what a burial ship is. So the Anglo-Saxon tradition was to put a king's dead body in the warship, so a ship kind of like this. And then you would fill the ship with a bunch of treasure, like gold and jewelry and war gear, shields, swords, whatever else we could fit in there. Then you would light the ship on fire and let it out towards the horizon so that the ship and the treasure and the king would be received by the gods and would be received favorably by the gods. Or, if your tribe wasn't close to the water, you would bury the king and the treasure and the warship instead. So that was called a burial mound. And in about 1939, we rediscovered some of these burial mounds in Sutton Hoo in England. And archaeologists said, okay, we got to dig this up. Let's see what we find. It turns out they found a lot. So you can see here is the burial ship, the outline of it. And these are the archaeologists who are digging and looking at some of the treasure that they find. So at Sutton Hoo, they discover all sorts of treasure that hadn't disintegrated um, with the king's body or with the king's clothes. So we found um, helmets, beautiful jewelry, uh, swords, and evidence of actually that the Anglo-Saxons were very good at making jewelry and were very artistic um, in putting together these ornate pieces of jewelry, especially for the king. So that meant that instead of people thinking that something like the Beowulf manuscript was evidence of a savage people, this made people believe, you know what, we actually have a very artistic, um, a very cultured group of people that we are studying here. And that's what gave Beowulf uh, the street cred that it needed to be studied in schools, to be studied by professors, and to be talked about as an important piece of British literature. So that's all I have for this video. Be sure that you have notes on your notes template and you submit those to Canvas, and we will start Beowulf very soon.